I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor, a Siemens business, with Jayan D'Souza, who's going to talk today about scan diagnosis. So Jayan, what is scan diagnosis and how does that differ from scan test? So scan test is the process of testing a digital design. You basically put the uh, design in a known good state and you expect to expect a certain set of values to, to come out. Scan diagnosis is the process of figuring out what happens when those expected values don't come out. What in the design caused that caused those values to change? And this is an essential part of any design of a chip, right? Absolutely. Uh, especially for digital design, this is the uh, this is an essential or de facto standard of what happens on digital designs. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. Jayan, what are we looking at here? What, we, what we're looking at here is a digital design, a typical digital design. This is, these boxes here are scan chains. The ADPG tool, which is the scan test tool, loads the scan chains and the scan cells in the scan chains with a specific value. The ADPG tool puts the design in this known state. It calculates, given that functional state, what should be the known good response. If you get the exact same known good response on a tester, you know that that design has passed. If the pattern fails on the tester, what happens then? So if the pattern fails on the tester, it means that something in your design has caused that pattern to fail, to, to make the, the expected values differ from what was actually measured on the tester. And that's usually caused by a defect in the design. Is it ever caused by something in the tester, or is it always the design itself? So it could be caused by something on the tester, but those issues are largely systemic and ironed out before we get to this particular piece of the process. Okay, let's follow this through for a second. So now one of these fails, what happens then? So when, when one of these fail, let's say this one becomes a zero, and this zero becomes a one. So basically the AD, instead of capturing a zero here, captured a one, and instead of capturing a one here, captured a zero. So that leads to what is called a, f a failure on the tester. That also implies that something in the design has caused those bits or those cycles to fail. We're dealing with a lot more complicated chips now than we have in the past. Does all of it actually fit into the scan chain now? For the most part, on the digital side, um, most of the design is what we call full scan or mostly full scan. And so a lot of most digital designs uh, employ this kind of technique with scan chains and ATPG in order to test those digital pieces. It's also getting more difficult because now you're dealing with some of these chips in things like automotive where you have safety critical applications. The requirements are much more stringent. Does this cover everything? Um, so this method can be can also be bolstered or uh, propped up by other techniques, additional techniques like BIST, uh, that's very heavily used in the automotive space uh, to make sure that the absolutely no test escapes, and you can even test this in system. Does that take longer? It could, in some circumstances, take a little bit longer, but in safety critical missions and safety critical applications, uh, time is not of no is no consequence. Now you've gotten to the point where you've got some failures, you've detected them, what happens next? So um, let's say you have uh, this case where you have these bits that have changed, uh, they're different from the expected value. That's where scan diagnosis comes in. Scan diagnosis takes those failing logs, the, you know, the cycles that have failed, and tries to figure out where in the design, what kind of defect in the design, and where in the design that defect could have been located to actually cause those particular cycles to fail on the tester. So for example, let's say this, this cell here and this cell here failed. It would, you would see, it would explain this bit failing and this bit failing. And this has sort of a boomerang effect too, right? Because if one bit fails, another bit can fail as well? Absolutely, so it could cause some, bit, some additional bits to fail. And it also helps us rule out things that didn't fail. For example, these bits here didn't, did not cause, did not fail. So it means that the logic that fed those bits were actually okay. They actually passed simulation. Let's back up here for a second. How does the diagnosis process actually work? 
So the diagnosis process is uh, basically a simulation-based technique. It's very similar to ADPG. Uh, in order to do diagnosis, you'd need uh, a behavioral view of the design, like Verilog. Uh, you'll need the ATPG test patterns that were used on the tester, and you'll need that fail log that came off the tester, which is these bits that these bits that failed on the tester. And this doesn't incorporate anything to do with software, right? So if your algorithm that's working off of an AI chip is no longer working with the hardware, that's not going to show up on on this kind of diagnosis. No, so the, the defects that we are looking at are hardware defects. Uh, it has, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not affected by the software that goes on these chips. The scan diagnosis process basically looks, uh, simulates the patterns that we, uh, the, simulates the ATPG patterns, simulates that fail log, and simulates and, and tries to backtrack from those failing cycles to figure out which portions of the design were the most important, where could have caused this particular, these particular bits to flip. As the chips get more complicated, does it require more hardware resources as well in order to run this test? Yeah, um, actually design size, uh, design sizes are, are, are increasing pretty dramatically with the complexity of the kind of designs that we have out there. And um, this basically requires, this process requires similar kind of resources that you would need for ATPG. So if you needed 100 gigabytes of RAM to load your design into memory, you'd need a very similar kind of footprint, memory footprint, in order to perform the diagnosis piece as well. And some of these chips actually are beyond reticle size, they're even being stitched together. Does it all still work? This would, all, this would still work regardless of how the design was actually built. Um, it's, it's basically the behavior of the design that we're trying to diagnose. So John, what's, what are we looking at now? So what we're looking at here is a, is a little um, a graphic of a, uh, of a machine that would perform the scan diagnosis. Let's say you had a, had, a, had a design that required about 100 gigabytes of RAM to load into memory to actually perform the diagnosis. If you had just one machine having four CPUs and 256 gigabytes of RAM, you would be able to use only a maximum of two CPUs because that would get you to the 200 gigabyte range in memory. So you basically are wasting two CPUs and about 50 gigs of RAM. Do these CPUs have to be calibrated or doesn't it really matter, it's just additive? These uh, CPUs are not, they don't, they're additive, they don't have to be calibrated in any way, shape or form. And as you get that extra uh, push in terms of more CPUs, more RAM that you're using and you're using it effectively, what happens, your test time goes down? As you get larger and larger designs, as you as you see um, as, as you see larger and larger designs, you see larger and larger number of fail logs coming off the tester. You are limited by the amount of hardware resources that you have to apply diagnosis to the to the design at hand. So w let's go into a real world example. What's a typical use of this? Yeah. So in a typical real world case, um, let's say you had the a machine like this, and you have a design that requires a hundred gigabytes of RAM. Uh, you'll end up using just maybe these two CPUs and about 200 gigabytes of this 256 gigabytes of RAM. What happens also on the, on the flip side of that is that you have two unused CPUs and about 56 gigabytes of RAM that's kind of unused. So would you be better off buying a lot of large machines or smaller ones? So typically, uh, the larger the machines, the better that you have to do diagnosis with, the better. But those are expensive. Those come at a cost. And really what people are looking for is better utilization of the hardware. As in this example, you have two CPUs that are completely unused. So you have a bunch of compute power that can't actually be used simply because the memory has already been filled up on that machine. So basically what you're trying to do is partition this more effectively, right? Correct. So basically what we're trying to look, for, look, look at is, is performing the same scan diagnosis in a way that utilizes the hardware resources more, more effectively by maybe creating smaller partitions of the design. What does that actually mean from a diagnosis perspective? Yeah, so from a diagnosis perspective, let's take a look at this particular design. We have some bits that failed, and we have an entire design and a whole bunch of sections of the design that passed, uh, that passed, uh, passed on the ATE. In order to, in order to find, the, uh, find what, what was causing these defects on the design, we could keep only a portion of the design that contained completely the defect locations. So in this case, what that would mean is that we could cut out an entire section of the design. Maybe this entire section of the design would not be necessary in order to do the diagnosis. 
So effectively, what you have is a small section of the design that eventually needs to be loaded into memory to do the actual diagnosis. What does that mean for the hardware? So what that means for the hardware is we really uh, loading up a very small design. It's much smaller than the original design was. You, you're keeping about 20% of that design that contains all of these defect locations, and you're going to do a diagnosis based on that. And because that design is smaller, you end up requiring a much smaller memory footprint in order to load it in, into, the, into the machine. So for example, in a hardware resource utilization now, Instead of requiring about 100 gigabytes to load that design, you would need about a fifth of that memory. So it's about 20 gigabytes of RAM, which means that you can now utilize the, the CPUs 2 and 3 as well that were not utilized earlier. We still need, we still use one CPU, one of those CPUs with the whole design to create these smaller partitions, but now you get much better throughput by using CPU 1, 2, and 3. Jayant Souza, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.